Hi everyone. This video is going to be the first in what I hope becomes a series of videos where we test out some of the ideas that are presented in physics. These could be from introductory physics courses or maybe some more advanced courses. Physics, like any other science, must be based on experiment and observations. And our ideas in physics and any other science should be able to make testable predictions for the outcomes of different kinds of experiments or different kinds of observations. So that's what I'm hoping to do in this series. And for this session, we're going to look at the concept of work, energy, some of the different kinds of energy, and conservation of energy. So we're not going to mathematically derive where these equations come from. We're going to talk about them briefly. Instead of talking about where these equations come from, that might be another video series, we're just going to say, this is our claim and we are trying to gather evidence to either support this claim or refute this claim. So some of the ideas that we're going to be talking about, we're going to be talking about this concept of work. You can think of work as how much energy does a force add to a system or remove from a system as that force is applied along a displacement. So the equation that we're given for work, if the force is constant, we have the force times how far the object moves, times the cosine of the angle between the direction of the force that's applied and the direction the object is moving. For this experiment, we're only going to be dealing with one-dimensional motion, so if the force and the displacement are in the same direction, that force is going to add energy to the system. It's going to add mechanical energy. If that force and the displacement are in opposite directions, that would remove energy from this system. We're even going, going to go a little bit further than this equation. This equation is only valid if the force is constant. More generally, if I have a force that is varying with position, the work done is the area under a force versus position graph. So we're actually going to be generating these kinds of graphs using a couple sensors uh, that we'll talk about in a minute. A couple other concepts. Kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is the energy associated with the motion of an object. And the equation that we're claiming for this is one half times the mass of the object times its speed squared. And if we put these together, the claim again is the net work, the total work done by all of the forces acting on the object, will equal the change in kinetic energy. So if I have a force that is adding energy to this system, well, that's going to increase the kinetic energy. It's going to be moving faster. And a couple other things about this kinetic energy formula. If I have an object with more mass and that's moving faster, it's going to have more kinetic energy, especially if it's moving faster. This kinetic energy depends on the velocity squared. So if I double the velocity, we should have four times the amount of kinetic energy. We're also going to talk about uh, other kinds of energy and for certain types of forces that we call conservative forces, things like the gravitational force, uh, spring forces, we can define what we call potential energy, how much energy is stored by these particular kinds of forces and systems that have these forces acting in them. For example, if we have if we talk about the gravitational potential energy on or near the surface of the Earth, how much energy is stored by an object depends on its mass. It depends on the gravitational acceleration. If you're on or near the Earth, this is going to be around 9.8 meters per second squared. And it depends on your height above some arbitrary reference position. Again, that reference position is pretty much arbitrary as long as you're consistent throughout the question. But basically we can say the higher up the object is, the more gravitational energy it has. At least this is the claim. If I have a spring, an elastic band or a spring, the energy that's stored in that spring is one half times this term K, which we call the spring constant. You can think of it as how stiff is the spring? Is it one that is really hard to even get to start to move? Or is it one that you can stretch it a little bit further before it starts to have a lot of force? It's one half times that spring constant times your stretch distance or your compression distance squared. And what we can do with these, 
is introduce this concept of mechanical energy. Mechanical energy is just how much kinetic energy do you have plus how much potential energy do you have. There are other types of energies. We'll talk about those in other videos. But this idea leads us to the idea of conservation of energy, saying the amount of energy, the amount of mechanical energy that I start with, plus any energy added by non-conservative forces, things other than gravitational forces, spring forces, there are other conservative forces, um, but say energy added to or removed from the system by me just pushing on it and, and doing work on the system just by pushing on it, or forces like friction or air resistance. They can add or remove energy from the system. If I know how much energy I start with, and I know how much energy is being added or removed by these other forces, that will equal the total amount of energy that I'm left with at the end. This is our conservation of energy formula. And this allows us to study and do calculations for a lot of different kinds of systems in a pretty straightforward way. Let me give you a quick example. Let's say I hold this object up in the air. Okay, It's not moving yet. Sorry, I need to make sure it's in the camera view. It's not moving yet, so it doesn't have any kinetic energy, but if I'm holding it higher up, it's going to have more gravitational energy. If I let this object go, it falls downwards, and as it's falling, it's going to a lower position, so it's losing gravitational energy. But that energy isn't being eliminated from the universe. That energy, as the object falls, that energy is being converted from gravitational potential energy to kinetic energy, the energy of motion. And again, according to this claim, we should have a balance for the total amount of energy that system has during that entire motion. These are some of the things that we're going to be testing out. So let's have a brief look at some of the tools that we're going to be using. Um, on this track, I have a relatively low friction track here, and we've got a cart that can move on that track. I've got a motion sensor set up at one end that will send out sound pulses, which reflect off the cart, go back, and you can measure where the cart is based on its position. So if I start my sensor, if I move closer to the sensor, that position goes down. If I move further away from the sensor, well, that position goes back up. So this can track my motion, uh, the motion of this cart, and we're going to need that in order to calculate, well, what is the kinetic energy? We need to know how it's moving to get that kinetic energy. I also have a force sensor uh, attached to this cart. So there's a little hook on the end here. And if I pull on that hook, you'll notice that the force value is changing. So let's say I were to attach a string to this hook. If I start pulling just a little bit on that string, we only get a small amount of force. If I start pulling harder, then in this part right here is where we're measuring our force. If I start pulling harder, I'm going to measure a larger force. And this force sensor is going to be involved when we're trying to calculate things like how much work was done by a particular force. So we're going to be doing a couple of experiments and let's look at the first setup that we're going to have for one of our experiments. So in the first of these experiments, what we're going to try to test out is this work kinetic energy theorem, where the net work is equal to the change in kinetic energy of the object. So our claim is that the net work is equal to the change in kinetic energy. Again, this is what we are going to test. And the way that we're going to calculate this net work is by looking at the area under this force versus position graph. So Let's write this as area under force versus position. And the change in kinetic energy is just going to be our final kinetic energy minus our initial kinetic energy. So how are we actually going to test this? Well, the setup that I have is a half Atwood machine where we have this low friction track. And I should probably draw this one. So we're going to have this low friction track. I've got a pulley at the end of this track. And we've got our cart. And attached to this cart, attached to the force sensor on this cart, I'm going to run a string over that pulley 
and I'm going to attach some hanging masses at the end. So we're going to have a string going over this pulley and have this hanging mass at the end. So that's going to be our hanging mass. What we're going to try to do is the motion sensor, which again is right at this end of the track, the motion sensor is going to track the motion of the cart so we can calculate what is the kinetic energy of the cart at different points along the track. We're going to be monitoring how that kinetic energy is changing. And then our force sensor is going to be able to measure what is the force of tension in that, uh, in that string. And as that force is applied along that displacement, we're going to be able to calculate how much work was done. We are going to try a few different hanging masses. The hanging masses are just so we can try this with a bunch of different forces and see if this work kinetic energy theorem holds up under a variety of circumstances. So let me adjust my camera back so hopefully we can see the end of the track. Uh, a couple of things that we do need to make sure of. We need to make sure everything is properly calibrated at the beginning of the experiment. So these force sensors, uh, I'm using vernier equipment for all of this. Um, force sensors in general, these, these types of force sensors, they do tend to drift a little bit over time. So I am going to have to make sure that when there's no force attached, I'm zeroing this force sensor. I also want to make sure that as close as possible, this track is level. I've tried to level it out ahead of time, so if I give this a little push in either direction, it shouldn't have too much of a difference between that. It's a very low friction track. It's not a zero friction track, but we'll see if that affects our data in, uh, in a little bit. We're also going to need to get the computer to calculate some very specific things. So first, we said that we're going to be looking at the area under a force versus position graph, so I need to, this to be a force versus position graph. We also need to get the computer to calculate what is the kinetic energy of the cart. So we have to tell the computer how to calculate that. So this might be a little bit small to read. I was trying to get it to zoom in, but it uh, doesn't seem to be working. Uh, let's call this uh, kinetic energy. Call it Ke. It's in units of joules. And we have to tell the computer how we're going to calculate this value. Well, our kinetic energy formula is 1 half, so 0.5 times the mass of the object, times we need to tell the computer to use the velocity data, and we want that to be squared. So in here we have 1 half m times velocity squared. We also need to tell the computer, well, what is the mass of this cart? It does not know that ahead of time. So I've got a scale over here, and let's take that scale move over here if I have just enough room to do this, put that on our scale, and if I can get the core out of the way, that looks like 896.7 grams. 896.7 grams. So let's put that into here. So 0.8967 kilograms. And now we've told the computer how to calculate the kinetic energy of this object. So we're going to have a kinetic energy versus position graph. Just doing a little bit of housekeeping, making sure those graphs are linked together so uh, these, those axes are fixed. We are not going to need that much distance on here. Okay. So again, the specifics of the experiment are, I'm going to attach a string to this. It's going to be connected to that hanging mass, and we're going to be able to measure how my force changes with position, and get that area, and look at how our kinetic energy is changing. And ideally, if this claim is true, these should match each other. So let's start with just a 50 gram hanging mass. Again, the hanging mass value itself doesn't really matter. We're just using it to generate different forces, which we are going to measure with that force sensor. So let's hook that on the end of the 
the end of the pulley. And I think I need to adjust the camera just a little bit so you can see the pulley at the end. The string is going over the end of the pulley. We're going to try to get as large of a range of data as possible. Uh, let me take the mass off just for a second to make sure my force sensor is zeroed. We can do a little bit better than that. So I'm going to re-zero that force sensor. And I think we're ready to take some data. So make sure everything's set up for this. Good to go. And here we go. Okay, so let's scale both of these graphs. All right. So we've got how our kinetic energy is changing with position. And simultaneously, we have how much force is applied. And for since we're generating this just by having that hanging mass in the string, that force is going to be constant. So... Let's pick a range of data. Right, we can pick really any range of data that we want for this. And for the force graph, we want to look at what is the area underneath that graph. Okay. So in this case, the network, the area under that graph, let's call this uh, trial one, This is trial one. Uh, the area under that graph was 0 0.271 newtons times meters, which is the same as a joule. If I can scroll down just a little bit so you can see that in a little bit clearer. Okay. And now we also need, over the same interval, we need to look at the same interval as, or as close as we can get to the same interval, we need what is the change in kinetic energy uh, for that particular interval. So let me highlight again, as close as we can to the same range of data. And we can calculate what is the change in that kinetic energy. So that's our delta Y. So it looks like we got 0.247. So this one is 0 0.247 joules. And again, if the claim was true, we would expect these to be a match. Now you're probably noticing it's not quite a match. The area under our force versus position graph was a little bit larger than our change in kinetic energy. Uh, let's see how far off we were. Let's take the difference between those. So 0.271 minus 0.247. I got 0 0.024. So let's add a column over here saying the difference. So that is 0 0.024. Uh, joules. We might note that these are relatively similar to each other, but there is a little bit of a difference. If I have the uh, 0.271 going to 0.247, it looks like we lost, uh, I'll probably put a, uh, in post, I'll put in a little like actual calculation for this, but it seems like it's around maybe 8% off. We lost about 8% of that energy. It's a pretty good match, but Let's see if we can try this for a few more cases and see if we can get any better data. Uh, another thing that's going to be helpful to note is that this range that we were looking at was around 0.6 meters. So if I move down in there, uh, yeah, that range that we were looking at was around 0.6 meters. We might be using that a little bit later. So let's reset. And I'm going to add another 50 grams to this. So we're going to be generating more force and see what we get for this change in kinetic energy. So again, I'm going to make sure that my force sensor is still hopefully zeroed. Sorry, there's a lot of windows on here. Looks pretty close to zero. So let's attach this, get our hanging mass. So again, now we've got 100 grams attached to this instead of the, uh, instead of the 50 grams. But again, that's just to generate a different force. So, let's uh, rerun this. Here we go. Okay, so we're going to have to rescale these graphs. And I think we can kind of just use the same ranges. Uh, we didn't change the range from last time. Uh, this one seems to be going a little short. I'm just going to reset these anyways. Let's, uh, let's redo these ones. Try to get approximately the same range for both of them. We've got the area under that graph. 
and we've got our change in kinetic energy. So let's look at uh, change in kinetic energy. Okay, so in this one, trial two, the area under our, our force versus position graph was 0 0.504 joules. Our change in kinetic energy was 0 0.485 joules. Again, they're close, but they are a little bit off from each other. Let's calculate the difference. So 0 0.504 minus 0 0.485, I got 0 0.019. Again, that would probably only be about 4% of our original energy. We're only about 4% off. That one's, uh, that one's looking pretty good. But let's get more data. So let's do another trial. I'm going to put 150 grams on this one. So add another 50 gram mass to this. We'll generate a new force. We'll see how those compare. So it just takes me a quick moment to set this up. Because again, we want to test this work kinetic energy theorem under as many conditions as we can. Let's make sure the cart's on the track. All right. So doing the same thing, taking the same kind of data in three, two, one. Okay, we've got to rescale both of these. And again, I want to make sure that we're still getting the exact same matching terms for both of them. So let's do that. Get the area under there. And try to get the same range. Uh, just trying to highlight the exact same range. There we go. Trying to get the same range for our kinetic energy data. Okay, so we got 0.72, sorry, 0.743 for trial three. So 0 0.743 joules. And our change in kinetic energy was 0 0.722 joules. Okay. Again, they're a little bit off from each other, but there's always going to be some measurement error in any experiment that you ever do. So we have to be able to evaluate does this error, is this error explainable by our experimental setup, or is it a sign that our claim is actually false? But let's do this difference again, 0 0.743 minus 0 0.722, I got 0 0.021. And this would only be, I'm guessing around 3%, Three percent of the uh, original energy, so they match again within about three percent. That seems to be a pretty good match. But let's go a step further and see if we can find any patterns in the errors of this experiment. Okay. Because you might notice that in all of these cases, the area under the force position diagram, the work done by that tension force as the uh, cart is dragged along the, crack, the, the track, is a little bit larger than the change in kinetic energy that we had. Let's see if we can maybe come up with a reason why. I mentioned that this track is a low friction track, but it's not a zero friction track. There is going to be a little bit of friction. So on top of this, we should also say there's going to be a little bit of a force of friction acting against the motion of the cart. And that little bit of friction going in one direction, so that so as the cart moves down the track, the force of friction is going in the opposite direction. So the work done by friction should be negative because the direction that it's moving in and the direction of that force of friction, those are opposite each other. So the force of friction should be doing a small amount of negative work. That would have the effect of decreasing this net work by a small amount. And you'll notice that these three trials, the difference between the work done and the change in kinetic energy 
we always had a little bit more work and it was by almost exactly the same amount every time. The presence of a small amount of friction in this track, which there definitely is, the presence of a small amount of friction would take some of that energy away from the system, which will not end up as kinetic energy. So that friction would decrease these values by a small similar amount it's the same cart it's the same surface the, for the work done we picked a range of data that was pretty much the same for each of the trials so the distance that the cart traveled this seems to match very very well if we say there's also a little bit of friction doing a small amount of negative work on this system Let's see if there's a way that we can get a better handle on exactly how much friction is on this track and how much it would have affected our results. So what I'm going to do is just push the cart down the track, measure using the motion sensor what is the acceleration of the cart, and from Newton's second law, we can say the net force is equal to the mass times the acceleration, and if friction is the only thing acting on it, from the acceleration and the force, sorry, from the acceleration and the mass, we can get the force, and if we know the force and the distance, we can figure out how much work was done by friction. So let's give this a try. I'm going to set up a slightly different graph, so let me change this around a little bit. I want a velocity versus time graph. And for a velocity versus time graph, the slope of the velocity versus time graph should give me acceleration. So let's see how this works. So I'm going to give this a little push and start collecting some data. Okay, so let's scale that graph. And notice it is slowing down a little bit, so there is a little bit of friction acting on this graph. And let's get the slope of that graph. So the slope of this graph, the acceleration of the object, is 0 0.046. So Let's write that down over here. If we have the force of friction equals the mass of the object times its acceleration. We said the mass before was 0.897, I think was the approximate value. And our acceleration is 0 0.046. So if I multiply those together, 0.897 times 0.046, I get the force of friction is 0 0.041 newtons. So the force of friction is 0 0.041 newtons. Okay. Well, we also said that the distance this thing traveled was around 0.6 meters. Again, it varied from trial to trial a tiny bit. It might have been a little bit less, a little bit more. But the distance that it traveled was around 0.6 meters. Okay. So if we use this work formula saying, well, the distance that it traveled and the direction of that frictional force, those should be opposite each other. We can say the work done by friction should be the negative of 0 0.041 newtons times 0.6 meters. And if we plug that in, 0 0.041 times 0 0.6, look at that. We got the work done by friction should be negative 0 0.0246 joules. That is really, really close to this disconnect that we had between the work done by the string pulling on this and the change in kinetic energy of the cart. That puts this into a really, really close agreement. In all of these trials, we seem to be finding that the net work really is equal to this change in kinetic energy. Again, work being defined as the area under a force versus position graph, or this F times the change in position times the cosine of that angle. Um, this seems to be matching up very, very well for us. So I would say this is very strong evidence in support of this work kinetic energy theorem. But let's keep testing this under more and different conditions. So before we go on to another experiment, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. I went through the numbers and our worst trial on this one for comparing the work done, the total net work done compared to the change in kinetic energy was trial two.
And if we consider both the work done by the string that was pulling on the system and this negative work done by friction, when we combine those two together, uh, the net work done during this trial was around 0.479 joules. And our change in kinetic energy was 0 0.485 joules. If you take the difference between those two and then say, well, what fraction, what percentage of this original energy was lost, you get, if I quickly run these numbers, I got less than 1.2% error. 1.2% error. I did the same calculation for the other two trials. Both of those were less than half a percent off between the matching of the net work done by the different forces that were acting on this object as it moved down the track and our change in kinetic energy. Uh, I'm really happy with these results. I was hoping for less than, you know, three or four percent. This is much better. So this really seems to support this work kinetic energy theorem. Another one or two things that I quickly wanted to mention is our work equation. We said if the force is constant, this force is, sorry, the work done is just the force times the displacement, and that's the same as the area under the graph. Well, for this graph, when we had a constant force, the area under this graph just makes a rectangle. The area of a rectangle would be the height of that rectangle, so this would be the force in that case. And the width of the rectangle would be our change in position, our displacement during that section. So this is just one example of how if the force is constant, we can actually match it up with this area under a force versus position graph. One last point to mention is when we have this constant force, every time the cart moves a small amount, we're adding the same amount of energy to our system. So every time I move by a certain small distance change, if this force is constant, we're changing the energy by the same amount. That force is adding the same amount of energy each time, which means our kinetic energy is going to go up by the same factor each time. We get this nice linear graph for kinetic energy versus position. Again, this is only the case if we have a constant force being applied. So as the position changes, the force is constant. This again is a pattern that we can identify that since this kinetic energy graph this kinetic energy versus position graph is a straight line when we have this constant force that supports this idea of the work kinetic energy theorem. So we've seen this case of the work kinetic energy theorem being applied to the cart when I apply a constant force to it, but what if I have a force that varies with position? So the setup that I have right here is I've attached a spring to this uh, force sensor. So instead of having a string going around the pulley with a hanging mass, I've got a spring attached to it. And the more I stretch the spring, the more force I'm going to get. So as the cart moves, the spring is stretched by different amounts and we're going to generate a different force. So let's first make sure that the force sensor is zeroed. So nothing's attached to it. Our force is around zero. That's good. And let's stretch this and do the exact same kind of experiment, but this one will be with a varying force. So let's take some data. Here we go. Okay. So for this one, let's uh, again select our data. We want to go with uh, something that looks like that. We've got the area under our force versus position graph is... We've got 1.238 joules. And let's look at the same region. So for this graph, we're going to highlight the same region, or as close as we can possibly get to the same region. And let's look at the statistics. Our change in kinetic energy looks like that was 1.172 joules. Again, we still get this effect that the... Uh, the work done by the spring force in this case is a little bit larger than the change in kinetic energy. So let's do 1.238 minus 1.172. What was the difference? I got 0 0.066 for the, uh, for the difference in those. And we know that there's still probably going to be a similar amount of work done. So let's uh, 
uh, sorry, work done by friction. So let's subtract off that part that we can reliably say is uh, affected by friction. And the amount unaccounted for is 0 0.0414 joules. So if we compare that to what we started with, again, it's a little bit further off than some of our other tests have been. But let's see what the percent difference is. I got 3.3% off. So even in this case where we have a force that varies with um, that varies with position, we still get this uh, work kinetic energy theorem being satisfied to a fairly accurate degree. The area under that force versus position graph is pretty much the same as the change in kinetic energy. Again, there's always going to be a certain amount of uh, measurement uncertainty in any calculation that you're ever doing. And one other thing that I want to kind of point out here is when we have this force that is varying with position, in the case of a spring, we get this triangular uh, force versus position graph. When we look at this equation for the potential energy stored in a spring, the potential energy stored by some conservative force is directly related to the work done by that force as you go from one location to another. There's a couple of technical details in there, but in this case, if I have the area of this triangle, well, the area of a triangle is going to be one-half base times height. So let's compare how one-half base times height for that triangle will compare with this potential energy formula. Well, we have the one-half already. The base of this triangle would, if, if I went all the way to when that force goes to zero and the spring is no longer stretched, uh, the base of that triangle would be the stretch distance x. And the height of this would be the maximum force that you get when that spring is stretched by a distance x. The force of a spring, when you stretch it by a distance x, the force of a spring is equal to k times x. So if I have this area, let me uh, scroll down to give me a bit more room. The area is 1 half base times height. The base of that triangle is the stretch distance x. The height is the force of the spring once it's at that stretch distance x. So that's k times x. So what we get is 1 half kx squared. It's directly related to the equation that we have for the potential energy in a spring. And in some of the other examples that we're going to look at, we'll actually see this spring potential energy formula come into play and we will give that its own individual test. But as far as the work kinetic energy theorem goes, we've tested this again with constant forces multiple times and got very, very good agreement, especially when we took into the account the work being done by friction. Again, our worst case there was off by only 1.2%. And now we've looked at a case where the force is changing with position. And still, when we apply this work kinetic energy theorem, we're still within just a few percent of having those two terms match. So this seems to be strong evidence in support of this work kinetic energy theorem. So I think I'm actually going to break this video up into multiple parts. I do have a few more experiments that we're going to be going through. And I think if I put them all into one video, it's going to be a really, really long video. So I think I'm going to break this one up into parts. And in the uh, follow-up to this video, we'll look more specifically at some of these ideas of different kinds of potential energy and how conservation of energy is applied to different cases.